welcome to our first episode of the Quilting Creators Podcast. And so I'm just going to give a quick rundown of what I hope to be able to do with this podcast. I want to be able to give some history on quilting and embroidery from different time periods. I also want to be able to bring on other creators and crafters, whether they're embroidery or they do cross stitch, knitting, quilting, crocheting, different things like that. I also will be talking about the different projects that I am currently working on and some of the struggles that I may be having. So then you can be able to learn from that. (coughs) So for all of you that don't know me, my name is Jackie Russell and I am the owner of Jackie Russell Creates where I talk about embroidery, applique, quilting on my channel. So we want to start out with um, a little bit about me. I have been quilting for, been crafting for about 30 some odd years. I am married of to my high school sweetheart. We've been together over 30 years, almost married 30 years actually. We have one daughter, two adopted daughters. Well, they're my daughter's best friends, but we have an open door policy. So they are my daughters. And I have four grandchildren from my daughter's best friends. And then my daughter has two puppies. One is Akita that is Keanu. And then there is Duke, which he is a great pyramid, pyramid, well, something like he's a mutt. He's got a whole bunch of different things in him. And then I have a cat. Her name is Sugar. And she is a Norwegian forest cat. So if there's anything that you would like for me to talk about on this podcast or someone you would like for me to invite to the podcast, just let me know in the comments below. Maybe um, if you have a technique or something that you want me to talk about or anything like that, anything you want me to talk about, just comment it below and we'll see what we can do. So for our first one, we're going to start talking about the 18th century embroidery techniques. So during the 18th century, uh, embroidery reached an excellence never really suppressed in terms of variety by any other period in history. It was an exciting time for embroiderers and therefore for us to look back on embroidery was a professional occupation dominated by men and exacting guilt <clears throat> it also served as employment and a leisure activity for women when embroidery was the main source of decoration for all of their clothes <clears throat> machines had not been invented so the craft was truly hands on I love doing the hands-on embroidery. It therefore required expertise, patience, and time. The regard we have for the craft is reflected in the many and varied garments that survive today for us to both admire and study. So let's get into the tools and the equipment. During the 18th century, professional embroiderers were expected to provide their own scissors, thimbles, and needles. However, the master embroiderer or 
entrepreneur would provide the spindles, bobbins, containers for trimmings, candlesticks, water, heating, and all the fabric and threads that were needed for the job. Needles is our first tool. Steel needles were plentiful supply in the 18th century. Production process was, were the same as today, except they were worked by hand with water power to speed up some of the following stages. The first stage, steel wire was cut into pieces the length of two needles. Heat was used to straighten the wire and it was passed through rollers. The wire was pointed at both ends on a grindstone and the center made flat, ready for the eye ink. An impression of the two eyes are made. Then the eye was pierced and any surplus metal removed from the eye hole and the sides of the eye. The two needles were broken apart and the top smoothed and rounded. Finally, the needles were given a polish. Needles were kept in a cylinder needle case or a needle book with wool flannel leaves. They were obviously more precious than they are today. How do you keep your needles? I just have mine in a medicine bottle. The next tool is scissors. By the 1760s, there were large-scale production of steel scissors, and they were becoming commonly used household implements. Previous to this, scissors were made of iron, brass, or even gold. Small scissors had a shelf to prevent the sharp points from creating a hole in pockets or work bags. Then we have thimbles. Do you use a thimble when you embroider? Depends on the project, but 99% of the time I do not. I do use a thimble though when I hand quilt. <laughs> thimbles were made of copper, brass, silver, gold, or ivy, often with an <laughs> indented top to prevent the needle from slipping. They were used to protect the fingers when pushing the needle's ends through the fabric. Two thimbles on each hand were used for padding and raised work. Can you imagine trying to work with two thimbles on each hand? I can barely get along with one thimble. The next is cords and braids. A cording machine was a mechanism rather than a small hand, rather like a small hand drill with a hook instead of a bit. By twisting a number of threads tightly under tension, then allowing this to relax and twist back on itself, a double cord was produced. Thicker cords were made by twisting three strands on three separate hooks in the direction then transferring them to one hook and twisting in the opposite direction there were always small frames for weaving narrow metal braids used to disguise seams or edge pocket flaps cuffs and stomachers braids were also made using large lace bobbins and lace makers pillow Do you make your own cords and braids? That sounds something fun that can be, you know, very interesting to do. It can give you a unique texture and, you know, one of a kind piece. The next tool is bobbins and spools. There were various bobbins and spools designed to hold the threads for embroidery small white wood bobbins similar to modern day thread spools were wound with silk or fine metal thread <clears throat> if there was a range of colors 
or shades of one color to be used in a sequence. They were kept in order by threading the bobbin onto a cord. This was tied in a loop and hung on the wall within easy reach of the workers. The spindle was like a heavy lace bobbin, which had a square or triangle base to stop it rolling off the frame. The thread was wound around the narrow neck and notched in the head, held the thread in to prevent it from unraveling. By using a spindle, the embroidery can manipulate the thread into place without actually touching it. An obvious advantage with metal threads that can tarnish easy. <coughs> there were mechanical bobbin winders that worked by turning a small hand wheel to fill the bobbins quickly. The large spool the thread was being wound off was held in the hand, spinning on a bobbin holder. This was a slender prong mounted on a handle. Yanks of yarn would be placed on an expanding skein holder called a shift and wound onto smaller bobbins or spools. Sometimes several threads were wound off together, making the working thread thicker and producing the double metal thread needed for coaching. The next item is a discard box. <coughs> A discard box is a shallow cardboard box, known as a discard box. Was always to hand for the wasted metal thread or mishap spangles. These scraps would have any silk cords removed and would be melted down and recycled. And then there's the frames. The most important piece of equipment was the frame on which the Prepared fabric was stretched before the embroidery began. Do you use a frame or do you use a hoop? This consists of two rollers made of strong oak of any length and proportion thickness. There was a slot at each end to accommodate the lasts. A strip of leather was nailed along the length of each roller and was to this that the fabric was stretched. The lath was two flat strips of oak about two and three-fourths inches wide that formed the sides of the frame. They had holes arranged in alternate rows at each end. The lath fitted into the slots of the rollers and the rollers were held apart by four pegs that fitted into the holes of the lath. A wedge could be fitted into the slots itself to keep the frame square if the lasts were narrow and the slots too wide. When the frame was very long, it would need a brace in the middle to prevent the rollers from bowing inwards. This was an adjustable rod, the size altered by a telescopic arrangement held in with a screw. It had concave ends that were padded to prevent them from marking the fabric. A work workshop would possess many of the rollers <clears throat> of differing lengths, but the last would be a uniform size. During work, the frame would be supported by a trestle at the end at a height of 30 inches. This could have a hole drilled in it to allow the frame to be pinned in place. There was a strut length of wood attached to the window well of the workroom at the same height as the trestle. This was known as a wall brace. The other end of the frame would rest or be tied to the wall brace and firmly supported. Small frames were held on the knee or wrist, resting against the table top or their own freestanding links. Circular embroidered frames were used for tambour work and these were usually clamped to a table or stood on their own legs. Next we have the cutting tools. 
These were knives or other cutting tools mounted in, in wooden handles that were used to cut vellum or thin metal sheets. The vellum sheets were used as padding for metal thread embroidery, and the metal pieces were used as templates for repeating designs. Another cutting tool used like a stamp was an iron tube with the bottom cutting edge in the shape of a round, a star, a rosette, or other such designs. These were used to stomp out spangles or sequins for the sheet from the thin sheets of gold or silver by hitting the handle sharply with a mallet. The sequins appeared at the neck of the scoop on the side of the tool. The metal sheets were stamped on a lead topped table. The next one is a pounce bag. I thought this sounded kind of interesting. A pounce bag was a small cloth made of circle flannel and filled with powdered chalk or crushed charcoal. Dried wine dreads and cinnamon powder were also said to have been used. Alternating, a roll of felt was dipped into the saucer and pounced, dabbing on to the prickling. Tambor hooks. Tambor hooks or needles were very, like very fine, smooth crochet hooks and were used for the chain stitch technique that was popular in the second half of the century. They were mounted in a handle of wood or ivory and held in with a small screw. The screw would project from the same end as the hook was facing and act as a vigil guide when actually tamboring. Awl. An awl was a heavy, sharp needle mounted in the handle of wood or cane. This was used to make a hole in the fabric for pulling coarse threads through to the back of the work. It would be used to prick out a design on paper as preparation for transferring the design onto the fabric. Tweezers and pliers. Tweezers, or small pliers, were used to pull the needle through the heavy pieces of work, such as raised or padded embroidery. They could also be used to bend heavy metal threads into neat corners. Now, I never thought of that. Sometimes I have a hard time pulling my thread through and you kind of have to wiggle it a little bit and stuff. You know, having the pliers there would be a perfect tool. So I'm going to have to bring that out and put into my embroidery toolbox. Melor. A small chisel shaped tool called a melor was used to flatten and model metal threads. They had different ends of particular jobs and the other end was formed into a piercer or a stiletto, again to make holes in a cloth. Felt dishes. A round, round of felt about four inches in diameter divided into components compartments, I'm sorry, was placed on the embroidery frame. This little dish would hold the cut pieces of pearl, beads, spangles, and other precision mater precious materials that were needed for the job at hand. A worker might require several of these dishes for a complicated piece of embroidery. How do you hold your, or store your, like beads and bangles, and pieces that you're using for your pieces. Do you have them in a little bowl just laying out on a flat surface? How do you use, store them when you're adding them to your embroidery? The next one is a knotting shuttle. Constructed in the same manner as the modern tatting shuttle, the knotting shuttle was much, much larger and had more rounded ends. They varied in length from 4 inches to 6 inches. They were made from a variety of materials such as bone, tortoise shell, mother of pearl, enamel, wood, 
or even gold. As the front and the back were quite large surface compared to em other embroidery tools, they can be decorative with engraved details, inlaid designs, and painted motifs. Ladies would carry their knotting shuttle and thread in a little drawstring bag, which was also decorated with embroidery and lace. These bags could be held on their wrist or put on the lap and contained the ball of thread to stop it from rolling around. Was working the knotting. <clears throat> At the end of the social evening, it could all be neatly stored away in a bag until the next engagement. So that's all we have for today. I hope you got and enjoyed learning about the tools that was used in the 18th century embroidery. Um, some of them sound pretty interesting and a lot of them sound like, you know, tools that we use in today's embroidery. So if there's something that you would like to learn more about, let me know and I will do some research on it. Until then, happy embroidering, my friends.